Okay, in the last slide, we talked about how a sarcomere is a contracting unit of a muscle fiber, and it is literally the um, area of the myofibril between one Z disc and another Z disc. So from Z disc to Z disc, that is one sarcomere, as you can see down here at the bottom. And each sarcomere has an I band on each side and an A band in the middle. The I band is the light band. Light has the, has the letter I in it, so that's how you can remember it. It's light because it's only composed of thin actin filaments. They're the blue filaments that you see here. The A band is the length of the myosin filaments. It is the dark band. Remember the word dark has an A um, in the word. So A band is the dark band composed only of myosin filaments here in the center. The H zone is the distance between the actin filaments in the middle of the sarcomere. So whenever the muscle fiber is at rest, the H zone is, is larger. And whenever the muscle fiber is fully contracted, the H zone actually disappears. And let me show you what I mean by that. Um, I'm skipping some stuff because um, I want to show you what I'm talking about. Okay, this is a picture of a fully relaxed muscle fiber. And you can see that um, the eye bands only contain actin. Actin are these, um, they look like a beads that have been twisted together, a little blue chain of blue beads that have been twisted into a rope. Um, but where there's only actin filaments is light colored, so we call that the eye band. And where the myosin filaments extend in the middle of the sarcomere, the length of the myosin filaments, these are the red thick filaments, that is called the A-band or the dark band. Now in the middle of the A-band is a zone called the H-zone. When the muscle is relaxed, the H-zone, the length between the two actin filaments, is large. But look what happens when it contracts. See how the myosin heads attached to the actin and bring the actin in close to each other, close together, completely making the H zone disappear. So that shows you the difference between an uncontracted and a contracted sarcomere, and that is called the uh, sliding filament theory. Okay, and I am going to go back to this picture and make sure that you understand what these structures are as well. Um, you could probably already tell that there are mitochondria that are found here in between myofilaments, and that um, the sarcolemma, or plasma membrane of the muscle fiber, if we go down across the, or down the bottom of the muscle fiber, we can see that it um, forms inward in making, and makes a tube. We say it invaginates. It forms inward and makes a tube that travels to the interior, deep inside the muscle fiber. And so if you look on either side of that tube, which is called a T-tubule, it contains the ends of the sarcoplasmic reticulum that are just kind of expanded. They're just larger. We call those the terminal cisternae. And those cisternae, cisterns store things. It's an old-timey word that means, you know, something that you use to store something. So um, there's terminal cisternae. They store calcium. So when you have a T tubule with two terminal cisternae on each side, you call that a triad. And the, the T tubule and the terminal cisternae are called a triad, and they're going to help to transmit the um, um, to carry the action potential all the way through the muscle fiber so the muscle fiber can contract and we will talk about how that works. Okay, so what happens in a muscle contraction? I'm gonna show you this um, by, there we go. I wanna just blow up this figure. I'm gonna skip some of the notes and just talk to you about what you're seeing here. Okay, we learned that axons can be myelinated. I'm pretty sure if we haven't yet. Um, this is a myelinated axon. It just means it's like an electrical wire with, um, with um, 
insulation around it. The myelin is like insulation around the electrical wire and the electrical wire is the neuron or the nerve cell. This nerve cell has three extensions at the end of the, its axon. So it's got three expanded ends that actually contact um, or come close to the muscle fiber. And this is where the electrical activity is gonna happen that causes the muscle fiber to contract. So everywhere there's this end, kind of expanded end of the axon, we call it the axon terminal of a motor neuron. It's called a motor neuron if it's a nerve cell, neuron means nerve cell, that attaches to a muscle, that's the motor part of it. So here, this is um, the axon terminal magnified so that you can see what it looks like up close. So what's going to happen at this region um, of the neuromuscular junction, the place where the nerve and the muscle um, interact, is going to be that the action potential from the nerve is going to travel down to the axon terminal. So the action potential is just an electrical signal, nerve impulse, that's going to travel down to the axon terminal. It's going to change the voltage across the membrane of the axon terminal. And that's going to allow calcium ions to move into the axon terminal. Then the calcium ions will stimulate these vesicles called synaptic vesicles. The vesicles are storing a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine or ACH. The vesicles are going to be stimulated by the calcium ions to fuse with the membrane and release the ACH into the synaptic cleft and then the ACH, which is green, you can see here, is going to bind to the sodium chemically gated channels. You can see an um, enlargement of that here down at the bottom. So the acetylcholine is going to bind to the sodium voltage gated channels. That is going to cause sodium to come into the muscle fiber. And that's going to lead to a voltage change. Um, the voltage began as a uh, negative value, and it's going to now change to a more positive value because sodium is positive. And that sodium is going to come in, is going to move in. And um, there will come a point in time where we don't want to keep stimulating the muscle. We don't want our muscles to contract all the time. We just want them to contract when we need them to contract. So acetylcholine has to be degraded and sent back where it came from, back into those vesicles. And that happens by an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. That's the enzyme that degrades the acetylcholine and sends it back into the motor neuron. Okay, so... These are the events that happen in generating an action potential or a, um, which leads to a contraction in a skeletal muscle fiber. The first thing that we see happening here, we'll just review. The first thing that we see happening here is, I'm not sure what I'm doing, but <laughs> the, here's the axon terminal, all right? The um, action potential arrives in the axon terminal. Calcium enters and stimulates those acetylcholine um, synaptic vesicles to release acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. The acetylcholine binds to voltage, um, sorry, not voltage, chemically gated sodium channels. So we say they're chemically gated because they are stimulated to open by acetylcholine binding to them. So the acetylcholine binds to the voltage, ah, it's, so, it's just so ingrained in you to say voltage-gated channels. The acetylcholine binds to the chemically-gated sodium channels, and sodium begins to come in. Once the sodium channels are open, sodium comes in to the muscle fiber. And remember, the voltage was negative. The sodium ion is positive, so it changes the voltage to a more positive value. And um, that's going to lead to what we call depolarization, changing that voltage from negative to positive on the inside of that muscle fiber is called depolarization. And if the depolarization is large enough, it will stimulate an action potential that will cause the muscle fiber to contract. Okay.
and this is where we are. Okay. Yeah, and then... Oh my gosh. Looks like we're almost done. Okay, so what we just looked at was depolarization. That's the first step that has to occur for an action potential to be possible. And that means that once the acetylcholine binds to the receptors on the motor end plate of the muscle fiber, the acetylcholine will open these sodium chemically gated channels. Sodium will come in to the cell and that will lead to a voltage change changing the negative voltage to a positive voltage. We call that depolarization. If it is large enough, it will trigger an action potential to occur. And then that action potential um, will go all that will cause the whole entire muscle fiber to contract. And then there will be a point called repolarization where the muscle fiber relaxes that um, this voltage, this is a voltage gated sodium channel um, that's found further along the muscle fiber, further away from the neuron. And this channel opens in response to a voltage change whenever the depolarization reaches threshold, when the depolarization is large enough. It opens the voltage-gated sodium channels, and that causes sodium to just rush into the cell very, very fast. And that will lead to the action potential, which will cause the entire muscle fiber to contract. And the action potential will spread all the way down the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber, down the T-tubule, into the deep into the interior of the muscle fiber, and then the muscle fiber will contract. But when the process is over, um, the action potential has to be restored back to the resting potential, which was negative. So how we do that is we prevent sodium from coming through those voltage-gated sodium channels by, by inactivating the gate. That's this little ball and chain thing, kind of, that, um, that ball is closing the gate up, allowing sodium not to come in, and then potassium channels are opening, um, and potassium is moving out of the cell toward the, um, just based on the fact that there's already a high um, concentration of potassium in the cell. So when it's allowed to move, it's going to move out where its concentration is low. So potassium is going to move out of the cell, and that means our um, voltage is going to return to its negative value. That's called repolarization. And then this shows you a graph so you can kind of see it. The resting potential of the muscle fiber is around negative 90 millivolts. As sodium comes in after binding, after the binding to acetylcholine, as the sodium channels open, um, the voltage changes from negative to a more positive value. Um, once the threshold value is reached, then that causes sodium to rush into the cell, and then that causes the depolarization to, to continue all the way until it reaches positive 30 millivolts. And then the um, repolarization phase is going to begin and that's where the sodium channels are going to be inactivated, or you can say closed. Sodium can no longer come into the cell. Potassium channels will open and potassium will leave the cell. And this will cause the repolarization of the membrane back more to a negative value, back more to this negative 90 value. Okay, so that's kind of what happens electrically. All right, let me blow this figure up. I'm taking my chances here, but um, let's talk about what happens to cause for the muscle contraction to actually occur. It's called excitation contraction coupling. What we're looking at is a magnified version of a triad. So here's your T-tubule, which is traction coupling. 